Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, though they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasure while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezar, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world, by knowing our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that were washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church family. Let me add a warm welcome to Dales. It's lovely to see all of you here. My name is Francois. I'm on staff here at REACH. And uh, I've been working my way through the book of 2 Peter. We're doing the third one today. We're right in the middle looking at this big chapter filled with some strong words. So if you are new, I'd encourage you go and listen to the first two sermons and Yorick will be doing the rest of chapter 3 in the next two weeks. So we're working our way through this book. But what we come to here in 2 Peter chapter 2 is some of the harshest words we'll probably read in the New Testament. But I don't want us to forget why Peter is actually saying this, the purpose behind it. Remember, Peter has a real desire and love for this church. He wants the Christians in this church that he's writing to to continue for years and years to come after he passes away. And Peter, like a father, pleading with his children, Peter is pleading with them, with this church, do not be led astray. He implores them, as we saw last week, to hold on to the teachings of Jesus given to us in his word and to remember the grace they have received. And so here in chapter 2, Peter then deals head on with these false teachers that were coming into the church and leading many astray. And he wants them and he wants us to be aware that that will take place. So that's what we are busy with today. We're going to basically work our way through verses 1 to 3. And as we go from verse 1 to 3, we're going to reflect on the other verses in chapter 2 that deals with everything that Peter introduces about these false teachers in verse 1 to 3. There's just too much in this chapter, as you may have heard, to go verse by verse through each verse. And so let me ask you, keep your Bibles open so that we can see what Peter has to teach us here today about these false teachers. There are five things that I think Peter wants to teach us about these false teachers. The first one is the presence of the false teachers. Secondly, the methods of the false teachers. Thirdly, the character of the false teachers. Fourthly, the influence of the false teachers. And then lastly, the end of the false teachers. And so, with all that in mind, let us pray that the Lord will help us as we jump into God's Word. Heavenly Father, 
this morning, we want to pray that you, through your word, would speak to us today, that you would help us to hear these words, to heed these warnings, and to hold firmly to that which you have called us to. Thank you, Lord, that we can pray these things of you, and we pray, Lord, now that you be with us as we look at this text. Amen. So, as we're starting off, we see the presence of the false teachers. It starts off there in verse 1. Peter connects us back to the end of chapter 1 with prophecy. It reads, But there were also false prophets among the people. Here Peter then draws a parallel to the Old Testament, highlighting that just as there were false prophets then, he continues in verse 1, there will be false teachers among you. Peter asserts that false teachers are an inevitable reality. And he uses this definitive language, will, is repeated. Do you see that? He emphasizes that these false teachers will secretly introduce destructive heresies in verse 1. Many will follow their depraved conduct, and they will bring the way of truth into disrepute. There in verse 2, they will exploit you. Verse 3, for Peter, this is not a mere possibility. It is a certainty that this will happen. And so the entirety of chapter 2 is then dedicated to warning this church and us about these false teachers that will come. He gives us a detailed lesson on false teachers. Their methods, their character, their influence, and their end. But before we get to that, we need to establish something else first. These false teachers are not outsiders, but are from within the church. In verse 1, it says there, they are those who deny the sovereign Lord who bought them. Verse 20 says it similarly, reveals that they were once among those who have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but then are again entangled in it and overcome. They are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Peter's message is clear. False teachers will infiltrate the church. And they may be hard to identify. Why? Because these individuals seem to have once known the truth. They may even be the ones that boast about their credentials. You know, I studied under this prominent theologian. In the end, many false teachers will come. And they start off well, but then they graduate from the gospel. They turn to better things and in the end, wreak havoc amongst God's people. And so Peter warns us, do not be naive. False teachers will come, and they will be hard to spot because they will claim to be Christian. And so with that in mind, let's delve into the methods and the character of these false teachers. The methods of the false teachers. So how is it that these false teachers infiltrate the church? What are their methods? Let's see what Peter says. In verse 1 there we read, they secretly introduce destructive heresies. These false teachings are not immediately obvious. They introduce their teachings subtly and deceptively. In verse 3 it says, in their greed they will exploit you with fabricated stories. They operate through lies and deception. Verse 13 highlights their boldness. They carouse in broad daylight. Their actions may start off all seek in secrecy, but as they start to gain a following, they become more bold, more shameless, and they do this in public. In verse 13 then, we see their manipulation. They seduce the unstable, they target those who are most vulnerable, 
Verse 15, we read that they follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, referring to the wicked prophet who sold his services to curse the Israelites for money in Numbers 22 to 24. These false teachers are driven by greed and their own evil desires. In verse 18, it adds that they entice people. You see, it's noteworthy here for us to recognize as we read both verse 14 and 18, they seduce the unstable. They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They prey on those who are weak. They prey on those who are unstable, those who are struggling as Christians, maybe with the lusts of the flesh. And we all know how this works, right? Consider the scam artists. Who do they target? They target the most vulnerable. Scam artists often prey on the elderly. Why? Because with the rapid rise of technology, many can't keep up and are vulnerable to this attack. The scammers come. They come across as so sincere, right? So kind. They they want to help. But their hearts are filled with greed. They're not here for you. They're here for your money. Peter is saying this is exactly what is happening with these false teachers. Like scam artists, they prey on the weak, on those who aren't stable, on new Christians who have just learned about this glorious grace of God and they start teaching them things. God's grace is amazing, but then they start to twist it. But don't, don't worry about the future. Jesus isn't really coming back. Don't worry about putting sin to death. God gives us freedom. Live it up. God won't judge you for the things you are doing. You don't have to stop. These false teachers use these methods to gain a following for themselves by preying on those most vulnerable. The new immature Christian and those struggling as Christians. But what about their character? What do we learn about these false teachers' character? The character of the false teachers. In these first three verses, again, we are introduced to the two most explicit character traits. In verse 2, we read that they have depraved conduct. That's ungodliness. That's the opposite of the virtues mentioned in chapter 1. And in verse 3, it says that in their greed, they will exploit you. They have depraved conduct, and they are filled with greed. This conduct is then further explained in the rest of the chapter. In verse 10, it says that they are bold and arrogant. These false teachers aren't characterized by humility, but rather by arrogance. But I think it's important for us to maybe stop here. What does it mean for them to be humble? Peter's not necessarily saying that every false teacher will stand up and be this bold, charismatic leader who spews out false teaching from the front. No, it will be way more subtle than that. Or it can be way more subtle than that. Humility is not just about how we present something, maybe kind and gentle, It is ultimately about submitting to authority. As Christian teachers, humility means that we submit to who? To God. And ultimately to God's word. You see, the height of arrogance is rejecting God and how he has spoken to us today. And so Peter's warning here is that he wants us to see that those false teachers are bold and arrogant. They aren't humble. Why? Not just because of how they say stuff, because ultimately they do not submit to God's word. But he goes on. It doesn't stop. In verse 13, we read, These false teachers revel in their pleasure. Verse 14, Their eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. Verse 19, they are slaves of depravity. 
There is so much to be said about each of these descriptions. We can go into them, but the fact of the matter is this. Peter describes these false teachers so that we can not only identify them by their methods that they use, how they speak and who they speak to, but also by their character. And so we have to be on the lookout. Are the teachers we are listening to following their own greed, their hearts filled with that? Are they driven by greed that is never satisfied? Is their life characterized by the virtues of true grace mentioned in chapter 1? Such as self-control, a pursuit of godliness, brotherly love. Peter says those virtues will not be present in these false teachers. They will justify indulging the flesh. They will revel in their pleasures. They will be slaves to depravity and so lead others astray. You see, that is exactly what happens. The influence of the false teachers. The fourth thing to note is their influence. Sadly, the reality is, as we read in verse 2, these teachers will gain a following. Many will follow their depraved conduct. And as they do, they will bring the way of truth into disrepute. These men and women, the false teachers and those who follow them, through their conduct, bring disrepute on the gospel. In verse 3, we see also that they will be exploited. Verse 13 makes it even more clearer. These false teachers will harm people. If you are deceived by these false teachers, you will not leave unscathed. This is what Peter is really most concerned about. Peter is not really concerned about the false teachers themselves. He, he's pretty confident what their end is, and we'll see that. Judgment is hanging over them. Peter's concern is for the church. Peter's concern is for the influence these false teachers will have on the sheep. It's the same concern that we see in Paul as he writes to the Ephesian elders. From among you will come wolves in sheep's clothing. Peter gives us this warning because he doesn't want those sitting in the pews to be deceived. He doesn't want those in the church to follow the depraved conduct of these false teachers living lawless lives without self-control. He doesn't want those in the church to be harmed. And we know this instinctively. If you are a parent, if you are a grandparent, if you've ever worked with vulnerable children, you will do anything to protect them. You are vigilant. And so that is how Peter is acting towards this church Peter, like this father, says, brothers and sisters, there will be false teachers who are driven by their greed and they will want to lead you astray. Be on the lookout. Don't be deceived. But why does it carry so, so heavy in Peter's heart? Because if you follow these false teachers, you may share their fate. The end of the false teachers. The most prominent theme here in chapter 2 that we haven't touched on is the end of the false teachers. Nearly every paragraph highlights their ultimate fate. In verse 1, as they introduce destructive heresies and deny the sovereign Lord who bought them, they bring swift destruction on themselves. Verse 3 tells us their condemnation has been hanging over them. Their destruction has not been sleeping. At the end of verse 12, they are described as unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like animals they too will perish. Verse 13 states, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Verse 17 likens them to springs 
without water and mists, driven by the storm, with the blackest darkness reserved for them. Peter's message is clear, isn't it? Destruction and judgment is inevitable for these false teachers. And the way he does this most clearly is he underscores this with three examples from the Old Testament there in verses 4 to 10. Firstly, he says there in verse 4 to 10, God did not spare the angels when they sinned. Secondly, he did not spare the ancient world in the time of Noah, but brought about the flood. And thirdly, he did not spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, burning them to ashes as an example of what will come for the ungodly. Do you see what Peter is doing here? He wants to reinforce the certainty of judgment by giving us these historical examples. Just as God judged the angels, just as God judged the ancient world with Noah, just as God judged the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he will come again and he will judge these false teachers. Their destruction is assured. And so we've seen that false teachers will be present among us. They will come from within the church, and at times they will look like us. But they will employ secret methods and introduce false heresies. They will prey on the weak and the unstable. They will be driven by greed and a desire for approval in their lawlessness. Unfortunately, they will gain a following and have an influence in the church, bringing the way of truth into disrepute and harming those who follow them. But do not fret. Brothers and sisters, their end is destruction. Judgment is coming for these false teachers. Their fate is sealed. The question now for us, though, is how should we respond to what Peter has shown us here in chapter 2? I've got three things that I think will, will help us. The first one is don't be naive. Don't be naive. Don't think this guy studied at George Whitfield College. We can listen to him and trust him fully. Don't be naive to think he seems so nice and kind and gentle. False teachers will come. They will be difficult to spot. So we have to be vigilant. But how can we be aware of this without being filled with fear, right? We don't be filled with fear everywhere we look. That's not Peter's purpose. Well, he's given us something to help. We look out for their methods and their character. And how do we do that? Secondly, by building our life on God's word. Build your life on God's word. Where do we go as Christians to build our lives? Do we rely on the teachings of our favorite preacher, our favorite podcast, whatever we're listening to? No. We build our lives on God's word. As I said last week, at our church here, as Glenn said, we, our desire is through expository preaching. That is, preaching the word of God faithfully, week in, week out, chapter by chapter, that through that we equip the church to grow up, to mature in the knowledge and love of Christ, so that we may be able to stand firm and not be swayed by this false teaching. And that means we have a responsibility as the preachers to be preaching God's word. But you have a responsibility as well. Your responsibility here is to be an active participant. Is what we are saying aligned with the word of God? Is that podcast you're listening to aligned with the word of God? Is that book you are reading Aligned with the word of God. That is what we want to build in us. So that when you hear someone say, well, you know, Jeremiah 29 says God wants you to prosper. You can ask, 
Is that really what Jeremiah 29 is saying? When someone comes to you and says, God wants to give you life in abundance. Manifest it. Use your positive thinking. Speak it into existence. Just have faith. Come on. Is that really what the apostles taught? We must, in humility, sit under God's word as our final authority. We need to be a people of his word. Studying it, reading it, singing it, preaching it. So that through it we are not deceived, but rather stand firm. Now as we have done, one of the ways the church has helped us to do this is through these creeds we confess. These creeds serve as concise summaries for us of the essential Christian doctrine as taught in Scripture. It has provided for us a standard against which we can judge teachings. This is what the church has held to for the past 2,000 years. You see, because in verse 1, what do they do? They introduce secretly heresies into the church. And so heresy is, is, is kept at bay through God's word. And specifically here, the creeds help us to do that. Heresy is defined as a teaching or belief that significantly deviates from the essential doctrines of the Christian faith as laid out in Scripture, and as historically affirmed by the church through the ages. These creeds aren't about everything. It's about the primary doctrines of our Christian faith. They focus on how we speak about God, the Trinity, how we think about who Jesus is, fully God, fully man, how we think about the Holy Spirit, And then it goes on to speak about the bodily resurrection of Christ and so on. And so the creeds help us. If someone starts to deny these crucial doctrines that the church has held for years and years, doctrines that are clearly laid out in Scripture, beware, stay away. Don't pander with them. You see, for me, I'm not very good with cars. I don't really know much about them. I have know very little about fixing them. So when I have an issue with my car, I get quite nervous. I have to go to a mechanic as I walk into that shop and tell them about my issues. I have to, in a certain sense, fully entrust myself to them. They are the experts. And so I go there, and they come back, and they say, well, yes, sir, I'm, I'm so sorry, you're going to have to fix this. You're going to have to fix that. It's going to cost you lots and lots of money, 5,000 rand, but don't worry. I'll do a little bit of the labor at a cheaper cost. What can I do? What can I do? You see, as I walk into that mechanic shop, I am vulnerable. I don't know anything about cars. I don't know anything about this mechanic. So I have to entrust myself to them and hope that they have their, my best interests in mind. But it could be different. Before I go, I can do a little bit of homework. I maybe won't know everything, but I can learn a bit about my car and what's wrong. I can speak to some people who know about cars, and I can, they, can, they can tell me what they think is wrong. I can do some research on the mechanic. How is he treated? Other people that I know and trust. Is he a trustworthy mechanic? And then it's a little bit different as I walk into that shop again. I still may not be able to fix it, but I have a rough idea about what it's going to cost me. I know this guy is rather trustworthy. I'm not just a sitting duck waiting to be scammed. Peter doesn't want us to be sitting ducks waiting to be scammed. Peter wants us to know that we can continue, that we can stand firm if we build our lives on his word as the final and ultimate authority on all things. If we are a people who spend time in God's word, we will know, we will know if we spend time in his word when someone is speaking falsehood, when someone's actions are in contrary to 
to God's ways. As we rest on His Word, we will not be vulnerable like I am when I go to the mechanic. But we will have assurance and security. And this is something that each denomination, each church all over the world has to struggle with. Will we continue to hold on to God's Word? Ask the churches in the UK, those holding on to God's Word, how things are going there. Last year, the Church of England, the House of Bishops, agreed on prayers, asking for God's blessing on same-sex couples. They commend that to the church. How did the church get here? You know, they hold to the same 39 articles that we do. They started off as well saying God's word above all things. It starts off subtly and heresy is introduced. There's a denial of God's word as the authority. False teachers come in and so they bring havoc amongst God's people. So brothers and sisters, let's not be naive. Let's be realistic about the false teachers, but let's not be filled with fear. We don't have to be filled with fear. We can build our lives on God's word and in so doing be vigilant about the methods and the character of those who claim to teach in his name. But I want to end with the third and most encouraging thing is that we can rest in God's strength to save. Rest in God's strength to save. I didn't go to these verses as I went through chapter 2. I wanted to end with this because this is a real encouragement. In verses 4 to 9, as he speaks about this judgment that is coming, as God judged in the Old Testament, so he will judge in the future, he goes on to say in those same verses, If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, the preacher of righteousness, and seven others. Do you see there was salvation in the midst of judgment? If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, but he rescued Lot a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless? If this is so, verse 9 continues, if this is so, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Peter wants to encourage us, despite what we see around us, despite the false teaching that will influence many, Do not be filled with dread. Just like in the days of Noah when everyone mocked him, yet the Lord in his mercy was able to save him. In the same way, the Lord knows how to rescue you from trials and ultimately bring you safely into his kingdom. And so in light of all of this, the three things we do, we are not naive. Don't be naive. False teachers will come and they will influence many. But let us be a people who build our lives on God's word. As we do that, we're able to spot the falsehood around us. But lastly, let us rest. Let us rest in our good God and his ability to save his people. He has constantly shown he has power to save those He has called. So let us rest in that. Let me pray for us and ask God to help us. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for these words in 2 Peter. Father, as we come to them, we do want to humbly Acknowledge you as the one who speaks today. And we want to pray, Lord. Will you help us not to be naive? Not to be naive and vulnerable so that we are deceived by these false teachers that will come? 
Father, help us not to be filled with fear, but through the power of your Spirit, Lord, will you help us to build our lives on God's Word. I praise you, Lord, that, that we are currently doing that here, here at our church, and I, I pray with all my heart, Lord, that you would help us to continue. I pray for each and every one of us sitting here this morning, that you would help all of us. Protect us, Lord, not to be persuaded by these false teachers who pander to the lusts of our flesh. But help us, Lord, to remember the grace that you have given us. The good news of your son that came to die on the cross for our sins. Help us to build our lives on your word. Not listening to anything that distracts from that. And ultimately, Lord, help our hearts to find rest. Not in anything we do, but ultimately in your ability to save. We pray this in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen.